Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, we got a good presentation today. Uh, Kyle from Island Exterior Fabricators will be talking about panelization. Uh, really great topic, really important in the city right now. So with that, I'll hand off to Kyle. Uh, if you need continuing education credits, we have the AAA sheet right here, and there'll be a link online coming up. Uh, if anyone online can't hear us, just let us know, and we'll take care of that. But I'll hand over to Kyle. Thank you. Please hold your applause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, so again, my name is Kyle uh, from Island. Uh, I've been with the company since we started our Boston office in 2013. Um, have, uh, we were lucky we hit Boston at the right time. Um, we've we've watched our practice and we've watched the city grow at just an incredible rate. And uh, we were we were in the right place, at the right time, uh, kind of doing the right thing. Um, and have been able to take advantage of, of the tremendous amount of design uh, horsepower that this town has and the incredibly knowledgeable and savvy ownership and development groups that uh, really understand uh, the value of building quality. And I think uh, probably the first like, elephant in the room is like, what is mega panel? What is a mega panel? Um, are typically, you know, the questions you get controls it's really straightforward right it is a prefabricated pre-glazed pre-weatherproof pre-clad um off-site manufactured facade system and the, the distinction there is um, we call them mega panels the moment that you need a crane to install them so once they exceed that four to five foot width of a traditional curtain wall or the 16 ish 15 ish uh, foot throat of a, of a man of material hoist to go up and down. Uh, and you look at alternative ways to install these. Uh, this really comes uh, from our company's roots in uh, you know, probably, probably 50 years of history in Long Island of, of plaster, lath, carpentry um, that turned into uh, some light gauge framing, uh, that turned into sheathing that light gauge framing and doing ethos, that turned into um, composite metal systems on top of that late gauge framing, thin brick systems, eventually plugging in punched windows into that. Um, and about 10 years ago, um, we really leaned on the existing technology, um, both in system performance of, of unitized curtain wall systems, but also in, in manufacturing processes with these three, four, five axis um, CNC mills um, that were available. And we really blended those two uh, technologies with the air quotes to create the mega panel system, which is a um, CNC milled aluminum frame. Uh, it does all the heavy lifting from a performance aspect. Um, it's a uh, dual gasketed uh, pressure equalized joint. So you're, there's not a reliance on field applied caulking. Um, these units are 15, 20, up to 30 feet long by a floor high, uh, we call that landscape mode. Uh, I think in Boston, we've encountered a lot of these um, high-end lab, tech, university, um, hospital healthcare projects that have a higher floor plate. Um, and we will often look at that, we'll just kind of reverse that, that method. Um, we'll take that 11 foot-ish um, dimension and we'll run that horizontally across by up to a floor height. So you're still dealing with you know, 125, 150, up to 200 square foot of panel uh, picked with a crane, set with a crane, um, and is, is very, very much as turnkey as an enclosure system can get. Uh, it's not, it's not, um, there's no need to break the building afterwards, drop it, uh, install your cladding, or install your windows from the interior afterwards. Uh, our point of view is that anything that can be done in the factory should be done in the factory. Um, and that allows us to really, um, from our point of view, limit risk on site, um, particularly safety. Uh, if there's only, you know, limiting that, that crew in the field um, really limits everyone's exposure. And uh, that's part of our philosophy. So what we have on screen here quickly is, is a small group here in Boston. We're about 25, 30 staff here, uh, designers, architects, engineers, project managers, um, same group in Hartford, Connecticut, um, as well as uh, Manhattan small group growing in Philadelphia, which is a market that we see like a Boston, um, very much uh, higher education, a lot of universities there, 
um, and, and sophisticated builders, um, all in support of the, the home base, which is Calverton, New York, um, which is uh, home to about a half million feet of indoor manufacturing space, as well as all of our uh, procurement groups, QA teams, our R&D group, uh, all the finance, all the finance departments, you know, AP, AR, uh, and everyone else uh, who, who really makes makes our operation go beyond just our design teams supporting local, local locally. Uh, what happens in here very quickly, and then I'll, I'll dig through the rest of the slides, um, are a few examples. So in, in Roosevelt Island, we did a 10 foot wide by 15 foot tall mega panel, uh, all glass with a perforated uh, sunshade system or a perforated uh, rain screen cladding uh, that we worked with Zaner on. That's a, a uh, I believe a net zero carbon uh, project at this point. Uh, locally here in Boston, um, Kendall Square Site 4, which is actually a hybrid. The two broad sides of the building are a, are a single story tall by 24 foot mega panel. Um, and the two short sides are a unitized curtain wall that interfaces and plugs into the same aluminum receptor system. Down the street is uh, the Vassar Street dormitories, also for MIT, much more of a, a brick, metal, and punch window. Um, motif, but again, executed as a large format crane installed system. And then the, the largest image here is uh, whenever this group or anyone on the phone gets down to Calverton over the next two years, likely the bulk of what you'll see uh, from a mega panel standpoint will be uh, one of one of any 10 buildings that we will have in fabrication for uh, Walmart's um, new national tech headquarters in Bentonville. Okay, so. Uh, that's with Gensler locally here, and um, it's a series of 10 four to five story towers, each in a slightly different brick or metal uh, profile, uh, integrated with the dynamic view glass. And what's on screen here is actually their visual mock-up, and kind of funny how things come full circle. This VMU is actually larger than the first project we did in Boston 10 years ago, uh, which is 54 Devonshire Street at Post Office Square uh, in the top left corner, also a... Um, a brick and metal uh, system. So are they going to keep the BMU or are they going to just... There was talk of it. I, I think they are going to tear it down and it's a shame that it's got air conditioning. What? Um, it does. <laughs> beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it's hot in Arkansas. Um, and the, the photos from the inside, it's a, it's a CLT slab, all mass timber. So the photos from the inside are just stunning. And I believe they're going to tear it all down. Uh, oh, they were going to use it as a construction office for the life of the job and then yeah. it's going to go away. Well, at least someone taking advantage of it. But it's it's some 20,000 square foot of the sub. Yeah, we build smaller buildings <laughs> overall. Um, kind of with that as the primer, I think the, a job that's a really great case study and is kind of really uh, pertinent is 665th Avenue in Manhattan. And that's, oh, sorry. This is, um, which is a, uh, a reclad, overclad, uh, repositioning for um, uh, Brookfield properties who bought it from the Kushners um, for Turner Construction and KPM. And uh, we we embarked with them on this design assist, uh, process. And uh, I think for a few reasons, uh, not only is it kind of the pinnacle of what we would call an efficient um, uh, system, but the size of the units, the size of the glass were kind of at the jumbo uh, limitations or interpane. So the yield on the, on the actual materials we were using was, was highly efficient, uh, as well as starting the conversation about adaptive reuse. And you see a lot of these, particularly in Manhattan, we've seen here at Post Office Square again, one of these repositionings or, or a reuse of existing building stock um, that really is probably its own discussion and presentation um, Altogether, but to us, is very interesting. Is how do you start to work with existing infrastructure, changing energy codes, um, and then a, a need or a desire by by owners to really get the most value out of out of their asset. So again, here, there's if you zoom in or if I zoom in, I won't risk it with the screen share, uh, but we have kind of mapped out at a very early stage every single detail on our on our digital model. Um, and the priority in which those are going to be tackled um, that allow um, kind of this effortless, seamless, glass-to-glass -glass transition up an entire 40-story tower. So 
So all these green tags are your critical details. So all, all the green tags here, I see Aaron in the back, he probably ended up modeling about half of himself. Uh, uh, you didn't work on this one. Um, so green, green and fuchsia all, all tagged for different plan section details. And that becomes a really critical process early on is with prefab, with panelization, is locking in at a, at a conceptual stage how you are how you are tackling the problem and then letting that uh, we call the design assist conform set really inform the rest of the shop drawing process. But every stakeholder in the room has weighed in, has reviewed, and has approved that basis of design moving forward. Uh, I think this is also a good slide to talk about scale. You know, it's not just the scale of the panel itself, um, but the scale of the project itself. You know, every fabricator, I'm going to have a difference preference than, than perhaps some of my competitors or, or others in the market. Um, to us, part of the efficiency of this project was it was over a quarter million square foot, one project. Um, that's a really great spot to be in. You, you can set up the factory, you can set up your supply chain, you set up your infrastructure from a shipping and install standpoint, and you just continue to see um, a really great yield uh, of the time and effort spent. Uh, the factory hits a rhythm, you're producing at a high rate, you have a strong backlog. The days that you can install more in the field, you do install more in the field because you know you've got you know you've got a strong backlog of panels waiting to be installed. Um, in general, though, I think we like to see any job that that we know we've got to be at a really aggressive number for. We like to see over 150,000 square foot of scope um, just to sink our teeth into as an operation. Uh, we've worked obviously on much smaller jobs. Um, I think as the complexity of these jobs grow, you need to really amortize design, engineering, mock-up time, even the factory space uh, on its own. So I think kind of scale, not just of the units and the material you're using, but also the job itself in the total scope. I think a big thing that Aaron did have a part in uh, was our digital delivery uh, kind of revolution at Island, where we started to really lean a lot more on the tools that are available um, from a scripting, from an information management, um, and we call this the wireframe, and it's essentially our central source of truth. It's a coordination tool. Um, it's a it's a scope confirmation tool. Uh, we generate shop drawings out of it. More importantly, we're generating information directly to the factory. Um, bills of material. We're we're working at a very early stage with our digital delivery team. Um, we build a hyper lightweight model. It's line, it serves its plane point, and all of that forms um, a much more comprehensive uh, bill of materials such that we can make changes in the model and very quickly have real time information to plan for procurement, uh, whether that's planning drop lengths on extrusions or blocking in glass block orders early on. It becomes a really critical planning tool for the procurement side of the business, not just for documentation and for detailing. What's, what was a lot of fun about 660, um, so much of that documentation had to happen upfront because it was an existing building. So what's on screen is, is not a picture of Mount Doom. It is, <laughs> it's actually just a, a very dramatic uh, screenshot from our um, total building digital scan. Um, so this, this the building, the entire building was scanned, fed into a point cloud, and at the bottom, you see uh, what looks a bit like a heartbeat line is actually a, pl a plan cut through a single floor. So the green set back in is your is your essentially your basic glass, and then everything outboard of that um, was the existing um, face of your of your columns and your cladding running all the way up the building. So what was the cladding prior, and then what did you end up doing? Uh, previously, it was an aluminum cladding and a punch oh. window. Oh. Pretty pretty brutal 1950s New York. Uh, mid mid rise. So is that an over clad tile or is it a reclad? It's a true reclad. So it was a, it was actually an active demo in a cocoon suspended from a uh, like a monorail brick beach type of system. Um, so that all of that system was kind of fed into, uh, and this is a, a variance analysis on each elevation, plus minus. Um, I think I think one, one corner we're we're out, you know, uh, point point six inches, and then. We're, in 0.6 inches, and this is an entire variance that um, on an existing building, it's really critical to understand where and when you can connect back to, particularly when we're working with you know 
four, five, six thousand pound units um, and attached to that primary structure is critical. Uh, so that all of that data informed, I, I think it's over 200 different bracket and attachment methodologies from channels, to plates, and gussets to um, HSS brackets that were offset at every column uh, where we were attaching these uh, these 20 by 11 foot units below the slab, which is a bit unusual uh, from our point of view. We're typically attaching above the slab on our on our uh, typical mega panel work, but we had to attach to the columns, span that entire column bay, um, and then deal with the tolerances of um, site conditions that were changing daily. As they were demoing, uh, we had someone uh, surveying that point and then calling in which, which of those brackets do we need to allow for uh, a different condition on each floor. Did you have certain brackets you got to use a lot of or was it pretty? There's typicals and, and you're looking to build in enough tolerance to that to cover most conditions, yeah. but uh, going around this, um, sorry, this is a, uh, there we go. So as you can, um, as you can see in the top right corner in, in yellow is highlighted in Rhino, the bracket that's embedded within the opaque zone that your columns and your, your, floor, your floor slab covers all hidden behind a single piece of glass. Um, so what you have here, right, is a single laminated exterior light, uh, and then a, I think it's a one and a half inch spacer, and then you're in interior light because there's such significant deflection that you see. Um, it's not a triple IG. Uh, if we were to do it again, it, it may be a triple IG, you know, today. Uh, and then there is a kiss mullion that picks up that opaque zone that you see in, in elevation here and a serrated, uh, effectively a serrated extruded shadow box uh, that kind of dives away from the edge of the panel. All of that is in service of, of concealing the uh, structural uh, gauge formed back band. So it's doing dual duty to your back band, but it was also kind of performing that Kind of composite structural role to create the entire span from column to column. On other jobs, so here's a, an image of, of uh, a job we're working on now for Princeton, uh, their new bioengineering and, and uh, uh, science center. This is a much more traditional uh, assembly methodology on site where we're attaching to the top of a slab. In this case, it's a CLT slab whether it was hollow core plank or a composite slab or cast in place, um, we're typically attaching uh, an embed into that concrete or, to, or um, going directly through uh, the CLT from the top with a P anchor, very similar to unitized curtain wall, just at a different scale and different engineering requirements. Uh, in this case, it's a, uh, a thin brick rain screen system that's set on a series of, of galvanized steel rails that we roll in house. Um, and then you're able to directly glaze uh, to the perimeter of the, uh, of the aluminum system. So it creates a lot of flexibility for design teams um, with how they wanna manage the panel joinery on a facade. You know, 665th Avenue that we just looked at, very much an intent to express that, to own that chunk one piece at a time all the way around the facade. Um, other, other teams that we work with are really looking to find a shadow line or a, or a change in two materials or align it to a window opening so that you lose that um, hierarchy of, of joinery at a material joint and joinery at a panel joint. Um, so we think that kind of our, our move to put all of the panel systems onto a unitized aluminum chassis uh, really allows that flexibility, um, as well as you know, some of the benefits you get from a true thermally broken extruded uh, framing system. And part of that right uh, at a large scale is the elimination of that every four foot or every five foot uh, thermal bridge you have. Uh, sorry. Uh, where you're able to eliminate your unitized thermal bridges by about 30% uh, by eliminating 
a four foot module and turning that into a single uh, 20 foot module. And again, uh, like I mentioned, this was a single piece of glass. So the center of glass value, uh, the effective value was 0.25, which is right much on the edge now for the new code that we're gonna have to look at. Obviously the, the opaque areas don't, don't uh, meet what Boston's new code would, uh, would have us meet. But to us, it really opened our eyes with respect to a, a huge piece of glass, um, not particularly high performing in and of itself, but the yield that you get on the center of glass value just completely changes the game. Uh, so much that we ended up only insulating the silk condition uh, as that married to a fire saving uh, engineering judgment. There was really no, there was really no reward uh, for insulating the entire uh, perimeter of that shadow box because the glass was already up of it doing all of the heavy lifting. So this met its kind of uh, very specific performance requirements for a reclad in Manhattan five years ago. Um, I think we're very encouraged by what something like this might look like in, in terms of tackling challenges in, in kind of the emerging stretch codes. Two miles left fire school still was posted by the light. Interior, yeah, interior, interior, yeah. Even the piece that integrates the piece uh, within the panel is uh, assembled in the shop. And then the galvanized steel back band basically becomes your substrate between the uh, edge of slab and back panel. Uh, we have been very encouraged by the work we are doing as we all kind of figure out exactly how we're supposed to react to, to some of the, the energy performance requirements we see in the code. Um, got two very brief examples here, one of which a 10 or 11 foot wide by 13, 14, 15, 16 foot uh, vertically oriented panel for a, like a lab uh, type of space, about half opaque, half vision, uh, very encouraging overall uh, weighted uh, UA value just below that 0.16. And then with triple glazing um, and two low E coatings, uh, pretty handily ducking under the 0.25 uh, requirement. And then another project that is a bit more punched window in, in reading and, and uh, I would share some renderings, but I can't. Uh, so the, the, uh, the therm model elevations uh, will have to do, but it's basically a, a plate metal uh, aluminum facade, series of punched windows. Um, and we're seeing uh, some pretty encouraging results just with a one inch IG. And then supplementing that from the interior uh, with additional um, Mineral wool insulation does does uh, allow you to reach some pretty aggressive goals and and, and tuck under the uh, the threshold set by the new new uh, stretch code and obviously uh, moving to a triple IGU um, kind of just just furthers that uh, performance you see out of the unit the effective R value. Hey Kyle, we had some uh, questions on shadow boxes. Sure. Uh, one of our users is wondering where the air and vapor barrier control layers are in a shadow box and whether or not you vent your shadow boxes and how to deal with bugs. Uh, we, we vent the shadow boxes because there's a tremendous amount of heat that builds up in it. It's something we've found, um, particularly when you're dealing with laminates. Um, if you do have a laminated IG, we try very hard to keep that out of a shadow box condition um, just due to the heat buildup, particularly shadow boxes are usually a dark gray color. They get very warm in there and you can, you can have a risk of delamination. Um, of that uh, laminated light. That said, we still do vent our shadow boxes out the verticals. Um, and uh, it's just a matter of, of uh, trying to mitigate the heat buildup there. Um, there's not really a, a risk for um, critters or insects uh, at that stage, uh, but it is, it is an important uh, consideration. Cool. Any trial with the if you invent the shadow box, would it impact the warranty on the IG? Like they do with uh, it's, a, it's a different discussion with every single IG manufacturer. Um, in that case, in particular, was it a warrantable uh, event? Yeah, warrantable without the. I'd have to check. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's one of these. Uh, they're getting smarter, we're getting smarter. Every one of these projects. Uh, you know, even even just from like a, a heat buildup and uh, partial shading uh, conditions, you know, our glass vendors were asking them to do that analysis 
uh, alongside of us. Have a dumb question, sort of. Uh, no, no such thing. Fire away. Well, we'll see. Uh, you know, as we get, you know, certainly in Boston now, as we've been here in the last, you know, six months, and then in New York City, do it, I would think. But obviously, much more triple glaze units. You know, as you as you know, we're running with these mega panels being, you know, like you said, the size of these panels, everything being, you know, hoisted into place. How you get? Is there a point now where these units are weighing so much where it becomes it's like a hoisting and reach and crane spec issue or anything like that. We're typically not the heaviest thing the cranes has to pick up on site. Yeah. Um, in general, but it's it's definitely important uh, to consider. So that that becomes an early stage of planning. Yeah. I think there's there's competing interests, right? You have a lot of general contractors that that tower crane has dollars sure. ticking away. Right. Um, they want to get that down as quick as they can. <laughs> right. We'd like to use it to hang every single thing in the world that we can. Right. Um, so there's competing interest there, right? But all in service of the job. So what was very successful for us um, at the Kendall Square project with Nadir Tarani and Turner and, and Perkins and Will was we took the crane in on shift. So we really amortized their, their time with the crane. Um, and we actually got to a point where they said, okay, we're ready for you to go back to days now. We said, no, thank you. Uh -huh. yeah, we'll take it at night. Right, and the right. parents will figure this out. Yeah. Um, and it was quiet. We were alone. You could, you, you got through the first ten panels. Pull up the next truck. Let's see if we can do five or six more uh, while we're up here. Um, you know, our work is inherently pretty quiet, uh, and there's not, there should not be a lot of banging and knocking <laughs> going on. Uh, but that's it's an important factor it becomes our, one of our first conversations with the client is logistically how can we support this um, while we do make and sell mega panels and that's what i'm here to talk about from my point of view it's a very similar kit of parts to installing this in four and five foot wide increments that fit in the, in the hoist um, we've done jobs where we do a split 50 50 sometimes podium scope makes a lot of sense to be unitized or sorry it makes a lot of sense to be panelized and that overlaps with when the tower crane is going to be there. And then running up the tower, you, you may switch to a unitized system, all working off the same platform, all designed, engineered, procured together from a material standpoint, um, just different size units. And then it's a good, it's a good segue, right? So our, our factory is in um, Calverton, New York. Near Riverhead, if you're ever, anyone's familiar really with uh, the east end of, of Long Island, um, it's where Grumman uh, Naval Manufacturing used to occupy uh, several buildings there. Uh, they built the, the Lunar Mod, they built, I believe, the F 16s there, and then a few stealth planes. Um, so they had occupied a series of uh, airplane manufacturing uh, facilities. About uh, 15 years ago, they moved out, went to Texas. Uh, we moved in and have kind of gradually, every time I go there, I need a tour guide because our owner has inevitably snapped up another facility uh, and, uh, and expanded a bit of our capabilities there. Uh, to support a job like 665th Avenue, you know, incredibly conveniently located, just right down, right down the LIE um, and into New York. So we really like it philosophically as a domestic American, final point of assembly, whether we're get working with really great glass from Germany or extrusions from Canada or Italy or Fonda, New York, uh, stone from Mount Etna, uh, stone that was carved in Portugal, um, terracotta from Germany, all of those materials are still being managed to a final point of assembly onshore in New York, you know, four hours from Boston. So, um, we don't like to go into Manhattan and then back up 95 if we, if we don't have to. So we'll do night barges. We'll, we'll book um, we'll book uh, we'll book an entire ferry uh, going from Port Jefferson to Bridgeport, and then run up run up through there. Um, obviously, as you get into these handling these larger panels, um, you have different restrictions state to state on when and where you cannot cross uh, with a wide load. Um, but we have an entire you know, logistician and his team uh, set up to manage exactly that for us. 
Why don't you like to drive to Manhattan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay in my HRV. I'm not so good behind the wheel of anything larger than that. So I, I don't know how our guys do it uh, with flatbeds, but uh, you know, it, it's it becomes in, increasingly it's like a double-edged sword, right? These systems are more critical in these dense urban environments where there is not space on site. So it becomes uh, to us, I think one of our greatest advantages is we have the experience, we have the infrastructure, uh, we have the know-how to take this from a factory to a site um, and get that installed. And I think that becomes really, uh, we worked with a brick vendor and we were at their facility and we said, can we take pictures? He goes, take all the pictures you want. If you want to go turn around and buy $50 million in equipment to do this later yourself, knock yourself out. <laughs> That's kind of, kind of that you know, uh, mentality. Um, so as I mentioned here, you know, eight, eight, eight um, mid to large scale manufacturing spaces, a half a million feet indoors, acres and acres and acres and two runways outdoors for storage. Uh, what we'll look at really quickly is um, just a few images of our, of our, it's called 400 A, B and C. It's our milling center, our, our kind of uh, the brains of the operation. This is where all of the information that comes from the wireframe model is sent directly to. Um, the Haas machines for milling steel and aluminum components for brackets, anchors, clips, uh, you name it. Uh, the linear extrusion processing machines, um, your Lumitex, MGs, uh, whether they're whether they're handling kind of our stock 20, 20, 20 to 24 foot uh, lengths or hand fed uh, for the anything over 30 feet, um, as well as our our uh, panel bending operations. Uh, that are really powered by the our, our true punch or punch machine, as well as our uh, laser. Uh, so we're lasering out or punching out um, any panel that's being bent, and that's being fed into uh, uh, a panel bender. Uh, back pans, front pans, uh, uh, thin cladding systems, green screen systems, you name it. So we really try to to manage all of that in house, take that risk on. Um, so that we're not um, in a position with a factory floor full of, of panels that don't have cladding, uh, because we, we've worked with a third party who, for some reason or other, doesn't have that trunk to us today. And we need those we need those cladding units today. Um, this is shop seven hundred seven or H on the diagram. This is and this image is set up um, four or five linear uh, large format lines. Uh, these are twenty six foot units. That were installed in Boston on uh, the Seaport L L4 project. So the left side image, you can see it's a double height, uh, it's five or six feet by by twenty six feet tall. As a single unit, uh, there is not a joint in that uh, twenty two and a half foot uh, continuous um, double height uh, metal cladding. There, uh, the alternating floors that are inset are actually hard stacked on top of each other to minimize any visual impact of that joint. Um, but wherever we could, we were building these. Uh, to span the entire um, uh, double line space. On a project like that, with a lot of soffit area, that's all that's all field stick built, or how do you handle it? Is that the soft soft off, soffit cladding itself is, is field built. Yeah. Uh, in this in this case, it was in our scope. Um, it becomes very critical to manage that interface of. You can see it running all the way up the spine. Yeah. At that point of inflection, um, those details there are incredibly tricky. And really have to be worked through. Um, so you uh, coordinated closely with the other contractor for where your scope and their scope. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're we're working with Turner hand in hand on that. Um, all the light gauge that was going to be done afterwards at the at the uh, pair of conditions when that becomes more than just uh, you know a two foot wedge, uh, as well as the softer conditions underneath that are turning back. And I assume those are like kind of pedestal or something up there. Yeah. If you had a small area near your scope that you couldn't do, uh, would you help share materials or procure materials if they all match? We've done that. Okay. So it's typically an app um, if their scope isn't in our wheelhouse, um, but there is someone who, who is able to do it, uh, but it wants to match everything that's running all the way up there. So we'll either procure that. Although, I mean, nowadays, um, particularly with painted finishes, they're, they're Pretty dead on matches if you're you working from the PPG playbook. Um, but yeah, uh, anything anything a bit beyond that, 
feel like we want to procure it all in one shot. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of the opposite methodology for setting up the factory floor. This is a station based build. Okay. So these were large format panels, punched window, uh, preformed anodized aluminum cladding, uh, where the labor and the, and the the different finishing groups are descending on each panel one at a time. Uh, so you'll see them in different points of, of completion from, from uh, the aluminum extrusions just going on the panel uh, to, to the thermally broken girts, to the operable vents being dropped in, to the cladding system going on all the way to the center line. I think has two or three, two or three units that are, have had their final QA, all the protections have been peeled off and they've been wrapped uh, to ship. What what helps inform if you're gonna move the panel down the line, you know, to various stations versus if you're gonna leave it in place and bring stuff to it? It's it's really a, a project by project analysis of uh, does this job so like a punch window job, you're likely gonna station build that okay. where you're dropping in a light, um, where you're doing primarily glass. And I'm gonna contradict myself in two seconds, so this is great. Um you may want to set up your glazing, uh, your your glazing racks, and just send units through them, basically. And it's it's very much driven on uh, how the units set up on the shop floor, what the materials are that we're working with. Are we kidding a lot of this in one of the other facilities and bringing it out, and you're just assembling it uh, at a station? A lot of factors are considered. Sometimes it's just physically how those units lay out on on the floor space, and that's kind of what happened next. So this, these are the units going up second shift. And then the next morning you come and you see another floor uh, was installed at, at site four. Um, for 660, we had 200 square feet of glass to handle at a time. Could not be installed uh, by, by descending this glass onto a unit from a deflection standpoint. Uh, and the units were so big, they were not gonna be set on a roller system to run down. So here's actually um, a diagram of the shop floor where we set up a short throw assembly line such that we had 10 stations and the units were built. Frames assembled, flipped on their back, um, structural back fans, anchors go in, flipped back up on their front in the third position, all of your shadow boxes go in and then lifted uh, into an A-frame that you see running all the way down the side of the shop floor here to be glazed vertically. And then from there, it was really picking these units up, getting them into um, their their container system to be shipped to site. So speaking of picking, and maybe, maybe you'll get to this later, but I've been involved in some mega panel projects. And it seems like one of the things you have to think about is um, the stresses that one of these mega panels is going to encounter above and beyond what that piece of wall where it should be stick built totally would. So, you know, that has to do with racking, you know, trucking, whatever, and then also, um, you know, any sort of multi-point picking, you know, all these sort of things are going to require some sort of bracing and reinforcing of, of the assembly of up and beyond what mm -hmm. building code might require, let's say, right? <laughs> yes, exactly that. So you're, you're often mm -hmm. the engineering, not for the load that, will, that the, uh, the panel's going to see in its active life, but you're engineering for that critical pick moment. Um, I think we we look to make sure that we're not asking these materials to do things beyond their capabilities. Sorry, I'm trying to get this to stop on these two slides. <laughs> um, perhaps this will work. Uh, but we really look at two different methodologies here. Uh, one is that container set, and then the other, once you exceed 11 feet, which you can no longer get under bridges, under tunnels, doesn't work with a double drum trailer, we're shifting them, laying them flat on their back in a collapsible rack system, um, and then really working to coordinate a wide load delivery uh, and getting out of those challenges. Uh, but that allows us to not have to strike a hard line and anything beyond 10 foot isn't a panel anymore, is it something we can do? Uh, so that's really been a, uh, a really critical aspect to manage is how you get these from the factory to the site, safe, ready to be picked, Limit that exposure. You're not typically shipping at an angle because 
even though that gets you under seven, you know, low overpasses, you have no economy. You, there, you right? send a ten thousand dollar. I mean, in COVID, it was ten, twelve grand to send a truck yeah, with one panel on it. Yeah, it makes absolutely no sense. I've seen it done, and I have it, it can be it can be done right. And <laughs> yeah. for the right job, you have a couple of these, and you and, yeah. you, and you make do. You make your piece with it. Um, but you're filling up your trailer. Either horizontal stack. You're or looking to optimize that trailer. Um, keep your shipping costs as lean as you can. Um, and then, and then when you arrive on site, again, you're working with a crew of a dozen, a dozen men and women. You've got two on the floor above you, setting it, two below, pulling it in, two of the truck, signal a signal man, super, two following behind, doing the only limited QA work you need, which is that continuity patch from unit to unit, which again, as a mega panel, you reduce that by 100% in the field because you're doing one every 20 feet instead of one every five feet. Um, here, let me see if I can pause this. Was that image? Is that the sort of what you were calling like serrated sort of front pan? Is that what we're seeing? Right? Exactly. So you're seeing the first uh, a foot or so is a is an extruded serrated uh, shadow box pan yeah. that sets back and meets that kiss million. So it does a, just a really beautiful job of framing these units, concealing all that. Uh, so. Uh, from a from a client standpoint, uh, we've found it a very effective tool uh, is our digital tracking, which which covers um, from a bar, barcode standpoint, uh, material in, material mill, material on the shop floor, panel assembled, panel loaded, panel delivered to site, all the way to signed off, and this becomes uh, a live doc that's shared on Tuesday mornings. Um, with our clients, some of them have it as their default like iPhone background and, and screen, um, and it gives them you know a tremendous amount of visibility with where we are in the job, uh, and it, it holds us accountable for where where we are and where we aren't. Is this something you guys developed in house, or is this just like a partner stuff? There's there's a few tools we use, and we've settled on one, and then we do a tremendous amount of work up front to to tweak it to the needs of that job. Curious, how many workers do you have in the front? Uh, usually three hundred men. Three hundred to three hundred. And that that number, we try to keep it consistent because uh, it's like anywhere, right? That turnover and that loss of the knowledge of a how we operate, b how the work is done, um, can be can be tough to manage if you don't have it. So we try to stay busy. We look at a lot of work. Uh, we try to keep the shops running uh, right at the capacity we need them to, so that everyone down there knows that they've got a job. We're committed to them; they're committed to us. Um, to the point where we have second generation. Um, uh, crews on the floor. I see the ZNC machine. Obviously, that's the big, that's the big, piece, the bigger piece of equipment. But yeah. do, you, do you do much of robotics uh, you know, there? Or uh, we've got a we've got a robotic welder, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I still need to get down there and take some take, take some cool videos and photos of it. Um, but it uh, it's constant, right? I joked earlier. I do genuinely often need a tour when I go down there every quarter, or if it's if it's not more frequent than that, because we have picked up some new equipment. We have relayed out a, relayed out a shop space uh, from an efficiency and workflow standpoint, or we've we're done building uh, Genie Gang's carved stone American Museum of Natural History facade in the steel shop, and now we're rededicating that to build uh, brick prefinished. Uh, Cassette panels for for the Walmart project, and there's a there's kind of this live churn of constantly searching for an efficiency uh, and balancing that with you know, we don't do out of a catalog work, so it becomes really critical to manage that information, have it available early, uh, get that material information to procurement so that they can strategically kind of push and pull when they when they want to buy the material uh, to have it. To facilitate the installation continuously and fabrication continuously. I think the last thing I wanted to cover here was a little bit of what we've been digging into in terms of embodied carbon, in terms of um, the work that we're, we're painstakingly trying to extract from our vendors and our suppliers in terms of, of their um, carbon disclosures, um, oftentimes having to work just with a nice database the, uh, uh, to get that information. 
And I think a big part of this, right, is, is tracking that embodied carbon of the material and of the components. Uh, the question really is those two other items, fabrication uh, and assembly, as well as logistics and install the site. Uh, that's really what gives you the larger picture um, of it. And so we've been very fortunate um, to work with SOM and to collaborate with their enclosure group, who sees this as a tremendous priority in their practice um, to understand kind of what are those what are those missing elements such that you can start to assign uh, a, a cradle to gate uh, A1 to A3 a carbon footprint uh, for a unitized system. And so it's something we're we're just dialing in with them. We're trying to provide as much info as we can about our operations uh, from a, a footage standpoint of factory space, milling, milling and CNC operations output that's not assembly space, um, kind of traditional and historic uh, energy consumption rates uh, for the facility, as well as output. You know, what do we get out of that? And how can that be assigned? Which again, is a tricky thing. We, my life would be a lot easier if we just built 100,000 flat panels all the time and we just did that on repeat, but we don't. Um, so it becomes difficult to even communicate that to someone who's trying to perform a baseline analysis of, uh, well, is one mega panel equal to four curve faults? Yes, but also no. Um, there's, there's a lot more material in those four curve wall panels than there is in that mega panel. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different aspects that go into manufacturing both of those. Um, and efficiencies kind of inherently between the two systems. So we've been we've been really really thrilled uh, to work with Max and the team there. Um, they're doing some very cool stuff. We're happy to be part of it. And um, I think moving forward, uh, what jumped out when they were, were forwarding this information was like the low hanging fruit in that in that bar chart um, is the framing system. Is uh, you know aluminum is great for a lot of reasons. It's not great from a from a uh, embodied carbon standpoint. And Hydro and Metra and Emark and ABC are all doing great things with trying to reduce that, and they're, and, uh, and they're getting there. But it's not always a uh, economic choice for a project is to use this this hyper recycled ultra green uh, material. Not to mention, you still need to send it from Scandinavia to the U.S. Uh, to use it anyway. So uh, I was. Selfishly, quite thrilled to see Chris O'Hara from SNYL um, review uh, these timber frame and these these mass timber uh, facade solutions at the facade plus last week, because um, that's something that's been a bit of a pet project for our R and D team. Just looking at are there ways to to utilize um, some pretty cool efficiencies in CLT and mass timber. Um, and integrate that as a substrate or as a framing component, uh, which which we're we're digging into, and we were just tremendously encouraged to hear that that might also be shared kind of within the larger community. And um, well, while you've got that uh, rendering up there, um, are you, you're, you're almost done here. <laughs> I think <laughs> I can let you off that easy. I think. Um, we, I know we've talked about this a little bit before, like when you have mega panels, um, one of the sort of effects of that is you're really consolidating um, critical points of potential air and water infiltration or thermal bridging to these perimeter conditions where the mega panels join together, mm -hmm. right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you manage? I mean, I know you guys have it all figured out, but can you talk a little bit about how you manage those um, vertical sort of stack joints and those, or I'm sorry, horizontal stack joints and the vertical joints to control at those critical points, you know, uh, moisture and air infiltration, that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, so it's, like I said, it's, it's an entirely gasket system. It's not a European single chicken head curtain wall. It's a, it's a pretty robust dual chicken head. We need that. More so from a uh, a wind load resistance standpoint right. than we do from a, uh, an air and water so you're shifting. Yeah. Exactly, you're you're taking the the wind load from the panel above, and you're transferring it at the stack joint through a more robust chicken head back to the slab at that anchor. Um, I mean, but that's a that's a pretty straightforward. And we, Aaron knows again. Aaron could give you the, this talk probably better than I could, but. Uh, we call that a hem cut. It's a, it's a CNC milled cut of the extrusions. 
uh, oftentimes you're leaving leaving a rebate or thank you uh, for space for the sealant to actually cure. Um, uh, as there's two weeks of meeting, and it's it's a tremendous amount of, of milling time, of bottling time. Uh, you know, you're, we trust the machine to do exactly what we tell it to do, but we need to make sure we're telling it the right thing. So it's there's a lot of, of, of mock-ups when we're developing a new system or a new tweak on an existing platform. Um, and then it's performance mock-up testing. Um, you learn something new every time you do one of these. Uh, you learn exactly, you know, should the, should the sealant be tooled a little differently here? Uh, are we doing something? Are we doing something here that we is different that we didn't think would have an impact? Because um, that is field labor, right? like not not the milling, but the sealant and, uh, and yeah, that's that becomes your shop labor yeah. um, component. So then it, it becomes making sure that that um, the crews who are assembling this and putting this together on the factory floor have their install manual. They have their assembly manual that's been vetted with technical. That's been performance markup tested. Um, yeah, they have their marching orders and and um, and then the field work, like you said, is limited. It's right. it's a it's a dial one two three pre cut flashing patch uh, installed at the joint. Thank you very much. Were, were there any other questions? Um, I was wondering, were the existing panels on the building failing the existing older panels or like what? What brought them to give this building a facelift? I think there was a tremendous uh, monetary incentive to realize the full potential and capability of that building. Um, I think uh, it was really as simple as that. So it's a facelift, it's existing stock building. It was not class A office space. And in Manhattan, you need to be above class A or your, you know, there's no class B, it's C it's below. Uh, so that's really it. Um, prime real estate, Fifth Ave. Um, they even went through a lot of trouble to change the name of the building from 666 Fifth Ave to 660 Fifth Ave. <laughs> Full rebranding happened here. It's got an FDA to Yeah. Um, zero. Hey Kyle, I have uh, I got one question on the work that um, I always done with SOM on the line of carpet. Mm -hmm. um, is any of that publicly available? Is that not yet? Um, I struggled to even get the parts they would share with me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But uh, I mean, it's it's really a work in progress. They've got a, a group there that's tremendously dedicated to this. They see the value and everything kind of shown on screen here. Even is like with a grain of salt. Um, they're just digging into this. They're working with a lot of you know, trial and error. They're working with you know, vendors, manufacturers. Like I don't know if they're working with another manufacturer, but they're working with a lot of vendors. And then they're pulling from a lot of you know historic data on on how to calculate some of these items. Um, and then it's a constant refinement process. So um, even some of those histogram charts are a little deceptive. You know, that chart was shown with a, a traditional one inch IG. So that becomes a triple IG and there's a laminate. Then all of a sudden, you know, glass starts to appear to be like your, your, your biggest uh, uh, offender there uh, from an embodied carbon standpoint. Um, you know, we're just we're just like that someone is really putting in the time and effort to do that work and we're happy to support them in it. And uh, I think very quickly, the architects in this room or on this call are going to be specifying this. And I don't know if anyone's going to be able to comply <laughs> or even, you know, uh, it's like anisotropy, like it's not acceptable, but we, we're not quite sure what the threshold is that we can put into code uh, or into, into the spec. So we see this coming in the future and, and we're, we're happy to be part of it and hopefully have a little bit of say in, in how this stuff is, uh, is put together. Thanks. How about, um, just capacity because I mean even Grand Benji place it's pizza and all this. But again, when you pick up a job like the uh, the Walmart campus, we're actually here like from Sean in, in Boston, like they're feeling the draw because a lot of their people are going down there mm -hmm. to work on it. How do you find like the capacity for that? Obviously the massive project for Walmart with other stuff. Right? Well, well we're hiring. <laughs> 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 the cards right there. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, right? Um, it's a balance, right? It's it's capacity 
at the factory, which is one thing, and its capacity like of our staff. Um, I think you have a tremendous amount of, of tribal knowledge that you can't lose. Uh, you need to rely on those folks to, to train up and, and to and have another project manager in training in tow to take on the next job. Um, but to balance like everything else, you need to grow um, and you need to be taking on this work. Um, but you also can't do so if you're putting things in jeopardy that you shouldn't be. So it's a, it's a tough balance. Um, but we've got, we our experience is we can't get our factory information and material fast enough. The moment, the moment we think we do, and our, and our teams on the digital side and on the procurement side are certain that, that we're ahead of the curve, you know, they're happy to just run through them because they've been set up with all the ingredients they need to do their jobs. Um, so I think we're still searching to find like, what is the real capacity of the current Calvert plant? Um, is the plant one shift a day or no? Uh, one shift for the three assembly halls. Um, the milling operations can run can run three shifts. Uh, well, we robot can run all night. The welder, the welding robot can run all night. If they let me see it, I'm still not 100 percent certain. Uh, but uh, we have it right now. I think in two shifts for the for the CNC milling center. Um, obviously, with the capacity to go up. Now, are your forces going to Arkansas for the install on that too, or hire local installers there? Install there's a little different than like our, our local install in Boston or New York. Um, but what we do is we send a key group there. Yeah. So we send a super, we send, and we, we try to work with the buddy system. Because um, again, local labor is always tough. No matter where you go, you could get someone great, you could get someone that needs some training. Um, so we try to pair them off. Uh, person you have on the truck on the rigging, you're going to pair them with the company man. Person on the floor, doing your anchors, the layout, brackets, you're going to pair them with the company man. Um, same, same on your setting floor, same on your on your floor above, uh, and and that way you can really try to mitigate that risk as best as possible. Um, in Arkansas, we're working uh, more uh, relying more on a, on a local group than we than we normally would, for us, given uh, where it is, uh, but you're doing that same thing. You're having that group come out. They're installing the performance mockup. They're installing the visual mockup right under your eyes, so that you can you can make sure that um, that's where the risk is in these jobs. Hey, maybe some of them are really good. You're gonna... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there is one question about the joints between panels and how they accommodate movement while still being air and water tight. Mm -hmm. You got with on that? Sure. Um, so it's again, so it's a gasketed joint. And let me see if I can. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> let me stop sharing and then I'll get to the right slide and see if I can do that. But it's a stop state. recording and then you can show us the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a uh, it's a gasket of joint and it's a laid receptor system. So um, the aluminum profiles um, are designed to a length where they can engage and maintain, uh, maintain their engagement and continue to keep those gaskets compressed against the corresponding you know, receiver uh, or chicken head receptor um, on each side. Uh, but it does come down to a lot of Really engineering heavy work uh, in sizing those in sizing those gasket joints, and that's typically at odds with what the design team wants to see is seamless jointless um, uh, cladding across across the entire facade. But you're dealing with not only overall building movement, right? That you know with live load, but you're dealing with Fabrication tolerances, assembly tolerances, install tolerances on top of that. Just the expansion rate of aluminum over 20 feet could be a quarter of an inch. And you're magnifying all these things. And you're, you're just you're stacking these things up because you have to account for all of these different little components, uh, which is why we see occasionally we'll see a stack joint at an inch and a half. And it seems like a it seems like a number that's too high. Until you look at the math and go, well, we, as long as we're accounting for all of these things, as long as we're sizing our joints and we're sizing our blades, receptors, chicken heads, and receivers uh, to accommodate for that movement, those gaskets stay engaged, 
your air and water tightness um, remains remains intact. Uh, and then your vent, your 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 pressure equalizing that chamber, so that if there if there is any um, water that does make it up over the first chicken head, you're letting that vent back out at the sill, um, and then you're draining it down out the front of your leg, and then across, and then down your verticals. And also, the, the, the visual seal that you see that that is just that is just that like primarily aesthetic, right? Isn't the performance seal further back? So your your exterior your exterior gasket. Uh, we call it a rain screen gasket. Um, it does perform purpose, um, but it is effectively the, the architectural or visual um, continuity there. Uh, the true, like Ryan said, the true performative aspects are buried within um, the system and the chassis and that inter intersection, uh, which is really great because it keeps them hidden from UV rays, which would degrade the silicone. Or I like the rain screen gasket. It, it, that makes a lot of sense. Like a rain screen system, so we did our rain screen one or more or whatever, right? It keeps a lot of the weather out, but it's not a critical barrier, right? Yeah. A critical barrier is protected. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Any other questions? We are. We are. Um, and we're we're kind of learning along with a few of the consultants that we're working with. Um, on on two or three active jobs now, um, it is what it is, right? It's intensive, it's a pain, uh, but it's something that we can do. Uh, Hannah does it, obviously. Yeah, I'm curious to see if it's your systems, but the uh, differences are between the current models that are showing versus. Yeah, so we've started at a because there's a commitment there, right, to doing some of those 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 three D models. And you also have to have a certain kind of set design to start with. So uh, we've been doing therm models, and then we've been looking at an appropriate derating of that opaque to try to account for what is going to happen when we model it in 3D. Weirdly enough, we found some conditions where when you model it in 3D, it starts to perform better um, at slab edges, because um, I think there's a the way it was the way it was worked through is the facade was not maybe meant to fly by. So when you do model the slab edge in, in conjunction with it, you're you're performing better than um, maybe the requirement was. But it's a learning process. Uh, yes. Is that another question? Yeah. Just another question regarding like the actual front of the buildings. Um, it's like the Kendall Square building. I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly, but I feel like there's a there's a slight like overhang of one of the panels there on the long edge or the short edge. So how are these connections happening at the corners? Do you have like one little piece? Do you have an attachment like, on the back side of the panel as opposed to the edge? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot you can do with cantilevering finishes off because that's the beauty of it, right? It's a rain screen. So it's not your your weather barrier is not following the line of that aluminum or stainless steel or terracotta. That is a effectively it's applied to the to the performative chassis. So uh, there's a lot that you can do with thermally breaking girts, um, using stainless steel if you need to to support that cladding board and to create a flyby condition or a cantilever. There's a lot of there's a lot of projects that we're working on um, where the the stack joint wants to have a flyby condition, and a terracotta panel wants to hang below that stack joint um, to hide that entirely. These are, they become tricky and they become a risk for handling on site for potential breakage, but because it's a rain screen, you have that flexibility. I just want to mention one thing with respect to the three dimensional heat transfer modeling and span board areas or opaque areas. So there's a, currently a study that RDH is involved with with Mercer Shield at SGH um, to uh, model and then also test at the French National Lab. So the second phase is being led by RDH to verify and then um, it's the best word, um, uh, adjust the model or calibrate the model um, and then define some standards for the three dimensional heat transfer modeling of span board areas. So that should be, it's probably another year before that report's coming out, but that's through the Charles Pankow Foundation. So they're funding that uh, entire study. So we're pretty excited about the results of that. And then the second thing is just kind of a shameless plug on the 
uh, on the on the well, and, and I'm looking forward to talking to SOM about it. But um, we're working on that embodied carbon uh, database. It's very similar to what you're describing um, through actually Ryerson, you know, TMU, you know, Toronto uh, Metro University, or I forget what it's called. Uh, right, formerly Ryerson. So they're doing, you know, all of the the, the LCA modeling. Um, we're providing some additional additional support, but that's through uh, it's called the uh, the atmospheric fund um, in Ontario. So all that money is coming from there, going through Ryerson. You know, we're we're consultant, but that uh, database is going to be posted on RDH's um, website probably by the end of the summer. So that's kind of already comprehensive. Um, very typical assemblies, but the, the the but is it's going to be for the Greater Toronto, uh, the GTA, Greater Toronto area, um, and what we're looking for is partners to do that same thing for New England or the Northeast. Right? So that we can look at those kind of assemblies uh, in this in this particular parking as well. So that information should be available. So you know, ideally, you'd be able to go in and say, well, where's where are you building? Um, and then do a quick, you know, this is not a model, but it's really about a quick assessment for embodied carbon. So that we can them together fairly quickly and understand are we, you know, are we near the target? Are we approaching the targets that um, various stakeholders have set? So that's all. awesome. No, it's, it's the right thing to be done. Right? Yeah. And that's all for now. Let me do one more question. Uh, what is the thermal performance at the stack joint? A work in progress. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Thank you so much, Kyle. <laughs>